So I'm going to play this clip. This is Terrence McKenna talking about a bunch of different things. This is a, a snippet from a longer thing. Um, and if I remember correctly, it's sort of parathetically that he's talking about um, what in his view has happened to the higher public education in America. And so I wanted to just play the clip for you and see if you have something to say about what he says and if you have your own uh, view on all of that since you've been in this field for so you long. See, you see, part of the illusion of the political history of the past 40 years was the illusion that we were all Presbyterians, we all ate white bread, and we all lived in the suburbs, and we all were white folks. And now the society is fragmenting. You're right. There are people who can't read by the millions in this society. Meanwhile, other people are reaching for informational technologies so powerful that they can barely be conceived of. And this is the consequence of political mismanagement. I, I mean, I think the American Union is flying to pieces because the notion of polity was betrayed in the 1960s. And that since the middle of the 1960s, this has been a police state of some sort. You see, after World War II, and they kicked Hitler's ass and all that, then everybody came back full of idealism to raise families, to build America. They'd been through the New Deal. There was a modicum of social responsibility and consciousness hammered into the middle class. Everybody came back. And then uh, the American political system went haywire, basically because we lost our nerve. My generation, I'm 48. I went to the University of California at Berkeley in 1965. My generation was the beneficiary of the idea that you should give a universal education to everybody. And they discovered that if you do that, if you take everybody and make them read Plato and John Stuart Mill and Voltaire and Hobbes, as we did, that, you know, you can't rule such people. They take it too seriously. They become ungovernable. They pour into the streets screaming about their rights. And so in the aftermath of the suppression of the counterculture of the 60s, it was decided that the goal of universal public education and the building of a population intelligent enough to run a democracy that would all be abandoned and the universities would be turned into trade schools and people would be given MBAs and incorporated into the corporate state. But no more John Stuart Mill, no more of that. And uh, the consequences of this have been to create a, a, a historyless and illiterate lower middle class where before the lower middle class was the pool of our intellectual creativity. That's where John Steinbeck came from and Henry Miller and all of the people who drove the evolution of cultural values. And, you know, we could talk endlessly about what went wrong in the 60s or why we were turned into a police state. But now the impulse of those kinds of repressive states is to forestall change. And change has been forestalled in America to the point where now, when it comes, it's going to be explosive, uncontrollable, revolutionary. We will be lucky to get through this political cycle ahead of us without having to hang some of these people. This was taped in 1994, I should have mentioned. Well, yeah, I knew when he said he was 48 years old and he'd been in college in the 60s that mm -hmm. he was 20, 25 year old. Thing. I mean, it sounds a little conspiratorial, uh, self, uh, you know, it's, it's a little too precious, a, a little <laughs> too, you know, we are the pure ones who once were in touch with the actual humanistic study of the thing. And now they've all gone crass and commercial. 
uh, I don't like this uh, making a kind of personification out of forces that are perhaps very impersonal. And e even if uh, the condition that he describes of a mass of buffoons who are, you know, being pushed this way and that by uh, large forces is correct. I mean, I think there's merit in the sense of, you know, things are pretty fucked up. Uh, the idea that they are doing it in order to keep us from something right, strikes right. me as uh, apocalyptic kind of talk. I, I know this talk because my brother-in-law, my sister died uh, sadly last year and, or actually earlier this year. And, and my brother, my brother, I think of him as a brother and he's, a, he's, I'm going to call him a conspiracy theorist. He's, he's better than just a flat out conspiracy theorist, but he tends to gravitate toward these overarching, you know, uh, uh totalistic, you know, they are controlling these forces. And I don't trust that, that, that feels, uh, sort of, uh, apocalyptic and kind of cult like almost ways of thinking. I, I don't, I don't like to think like that. Um, I don't think the description is correct, frankly, that people don't read Hobbes and Voltaire and Mill. It's true though, that the lower middle class massives on the whole are not familiar with those books. I wonder how familiar lower middle class is everywhere with those books. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, I, that's an empirical question about, you know, where do intellectuals come from? And I'm, I'm, I'm not denying it, but I'm, I remain to be convinced. Uh, Is there any matter to what he's saying about the change of the uh, universities? Like, is it, have you seen uh, a change of, and I have, in what is I have, there's a book. I, 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 you know, in, in my course on free inquiry, we teach this book, the closing of the American mind. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget the author's name at the moment. It'll come to me. Uh, but, uh, Alan Bloom, Alan Bloom, this mm -hmm. is from the eighties where he's lamenting, uh, a less grand, uh, uh, statement of the same thesis as William Derejewitz. He's a guy that's got a book called excellent sheep excellent sheep where he talks about the universities as being factories producing MBAs and mm -hmm. whatnot and, and, and not, not really educating people to be agents of, you know, critical evaluation of social developments and thinking for themselves in, informed by the great books, but able to, to think for themselves. We're all, it says Derejewitz, uh, the universities have become factories of a sort. So, that, I mean, I know that sentiment. I, and would I agree? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, he, he hasn't uh, experienced Title IX, you know, the regulations on sexual uh, inappropriate behavior and whatnot. He, he hasn't experienced cancel culture where people are not allowed to speak and when they, they have contrary ideas or all of this right, mm -hmm. right thinking mm -hmm. kind of genuflecting that people do when they have to signal that they're all on the right side of his, he, you know, so I, I think the state of the universities is, is something to be concerned about. That's why the University of Austin, <laughs> this, this new, uh, you know, thing that people are talking about. Barry Weiss, what's happened to journalism? Matt Taibbi. So, sure. Why are you asking me this? Well, it just, uh, I've, I've heard, uh, I listen to Terrence McKinnon every once in a while, and I've heard him mention this idea, this is parathetically to his overall range of topics, uh, but because I don't know, I have no idea what the American universities used to be like, uh, and what I know about what they are now is also, you know, sort of hearsay, you know, I, I observe from very far. Uh, I'm curious about your, so this is not, I, I didn't necessarily want um, McKenna's uh, view to be s at center here. Um, I, I've heard. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we won't make it about him. I've heard two uh, different critiques of the, um, how the university system has changed in the last several decades. One from the left, one from the right. From the left, it's like, uh, it's become too commercialized. The students are customers. 
So they need to be yeah. given uh, what they have paid for. They need to be kept comfortable and happy. And yeah, that's so Daniel they, Bessner. Mm-hmm. So they're, you know, not being challenged and so forth. And then from the right, uh, the notion I've heard is all of these uh, revolutionaries that didn't happen in the 60s uh, went into the academia and became professors and started preaching their, uh, you know, lefty ideas. And here we have all this neo-Marxism and, and whatnot. Maybe these two things are happening at the same time. Maybe one of them is not happening at all. Uh, but I wanted just to have your view of how how the universities have changed and whether you have any ideas for why they've changed in that way. Yeah, it's not something I have a whole lot to say about the key. To, I think both claims have a lot of uh, truth to them. Uh, I think it is that the class of... 60s and 70s revolutionaries became academics equipped with, you know, uh, a kind of postmodern critical sensibility and uh, distrusting of capitalism, of, of American empire, uh, of uh, so-called white supremacy. This is a latter-day manifestation of it. And, and they now do man the heights of you know, the anthropology departments and the sociology departments and, and the African American studies departments and uh, in history departments. Uh, this is David Kaiser, the guy that I've uh, been talking with. And in fact, he could be another person that I could talk with every two or three months. Uh, David is a retired historian. He's of my generation, a white guy. Uh, we talked about the racial wealth gap a little bit at the newsletter. But uh, he's an American historian, but he had al also uh, international relations, history of American European um, affairs, kind of. He's a thoughtful guy and he, he laments what's happened. So that certainly has happened that uh, from a criticism from the right of the radical, you know, the Marxian, Marxian influence. I hate to even throw these words around because they're cliches, <laughs> but. Uh, but I, I think there's merit to the criticism from the left that uh, this is, these are coddled, uh, you know, kind of we got to get the dormitory environment and what's on the menu at the cafeteria and are the swimming facilities, you know, and, and all this kind of consumerist uh, middle, upper middle class. Uh, but what's happened to the universities? I think it's got to got to be big forces as well uh, that are are foot in that I don't I don't really claim to understand. I mean, one response I might have uh, is to talk about my own experience within the university as a as a teacher, because on the outside, uh, a lot of the uh, critics of what's happening in the university are certainly correct uh, that. You know, we've kind of lost our way and the passion for knowing and learning and so on. Uh, but there are pockets of of uh, exquisite uh, devotion to the life of the mind. And I think I'm fortunate uh, to be able to experience that in my own uh, in my own classes. I mean, I just give one example from this semester's course on race and inequality, where I've been holding forth as an anti wokester. You know, I've been holding forth against. Ta-Nehisi Coates, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Ibram X. Kendi, and so forth. I have, you know, their readings on the list, but I, I try to rebut them vigorously, and I've been pushing my line, the, the line that you hear me and John McWhorter talking about all the time at the Glenn Show. And I'm looking for pushback. And when their papers come in, sometimes the pushback is really very thoughtful, um, and I engage in back and forth with them in responding to the papers. And now, that was at midterm, now we're at the final papers, and I asked each one of them, these are 34 students, to uh, have a conversation with me about what they propose to do in their final papers. And I, and I find that uh, they are, you know, all over the place, interesting, they want to raise questions, they want to uh, delve deeper, they're creative, they're thoughtful. Um, I could give examples. I mean, we're talking about police, uh, black community relations and whatnot. And uh, one kid wants to look at uh, the uh, um, relationship between 
anti-racism as applied in college admissions and anti-racism as a as it would work out in uh who gets sent to jail and if we're concerned about racial disproportion and who goes to the colleges and we want to have affirmative action would it make any sense whatsoever to have any kind of intervention in the criminal justice system that was oriented toward promoting racial balance and he realizes that it would not make sense and then he wants to know why what are the ethical intuitions that vary as between these two different venues, higher education admissions on the one hand and lower education, that is prison admissions on the other, where we're prepared to tolerate racial disparity without intervention on the one hand, the latter, but not in the former, and leads to various kind of interesting philosophical things. I just give one example, but I'm just saying it's, it's not as if we can't, we're not having that discussion in the university or people are not being challenged uh, in, in the university to pursue these ideas in, in depth. I'm doing it with my own students in my own classes.